In Myrtle Beach, you always go at your own pace. Lie out on the sand, lie out by the pool, go boogie boarding, go surfing, walk the boardwalk, walk the marsh walk, golf at one of 90 golf courses, mini golf at one of 50 mini golf courses, fish off a pier, fish from a chartered boat, go shopping, get drinks, eat the freshest seafood. The list is exhaustive, but the experience isn't. You can go all out or do nothing at all. How you relax is up to you. There is so much to do and explore, whether you're traveling with friends, family, or just yourself. With 60 miles of beach, you're going to find your place. If this sounds like what you need, then this is where you belong. Realtree has always had a connection to the fishing industry and the outdoor lifestyle. In 2016, Realtree expanded on the traditional business of creating the world's most effective camouflage patterns to create a fishing brand and family of patterns designed to connect the woods to the water and strengthen the bond between the two worlds. We couldn't be more excited to be working with the industry's top brands, retailers, and anglers to continue our growth, and we hope that you will join us. Enjoy Realtree fishing patterns inshore, offshore, on the lake, or at the dock. Learn more about the extensive line Realtree fishing patterns, apparel, gear, and more at Realtree.com. Hey, do y'all like fishing for prizes? Maybe a trip to Costa Rica or a once-in-a-lifetime African safari? Well, the Grand Strand Fishing Rodeo is back. Thanks to the hard work of Visit Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and Trilogy Outdoors Media, this once popular event is back and is bigger and better than ever. This event is comprised of 12 monthly competitions that culminate in November with our annual banquet and expo, the celebration of fishing on the Grand Strand. New to this event is the freshwater division that will help include all of our anglers that live and visit the Grand Strand throughout the year. Monthly species winners will receive great prize packages from Bass Pro Shop and Surf Signs and Designs. But most importantly, they will receive an invite for them and a guest to our annual banquet and an entry in the grand prize draw. So whether you fish the rivers, a pond, the pier, the surf, or a boat, you have a chance to win the grand prizes. To get signed up or for additional information, visit TrilogyOutdoorsMedia.com and click on Event. Also, you can visit any of our way stations and registration stations to get signed up as well. Thanks to our wonderful sponsors, South Atlantic Bank, Surf Signs and Designs, Bass Pro Shops, Trilogy Outdoors Media, Visit Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and many more. Best of luck to everyone, and we'll see you at the scale. Trilogy Outdoors. All right, folks, welcome to this week's episode of Trilogy Outdoors. And uh, you know what? We are back in the studio, Stephen. It's nice to be Back at the studio, although that last studio we had was pretty nice. Yeah, I mean, it's super nice. I enjoyed that. Uh, when you get to go to a, a duck club like that, uh, I mean, that, I'd say the lodge, mm, 10 out of 10. Not, I mean, you don't want a, you don't, you don't want a uh, Ritz-Carlton as a duck lodge. You want it to feel like a duck, duck lodge, but for duck lodges, 10 out of 10. Don't you agree? I agree. Completely. Super nice. 10 out of 10. Super nice. Uh, the crowd there was great. Um, it was so nice to hang out and uh, actually run into so many people that actually listened to the podcast. Oh, yeah. And that was really cool. Yeah. Um, and, of course, you know, my partner is kind of a big deal. So, <laughs> I'm sure, hey, I'm sure most of them were saying, oh, yeah, we listen to your podcast all the time. And then they were going back over in the corner and going, hey, what's the name of this podcast? Somebody play something. Let me listen to it. Where's my nameplate? Yeah. Oh, oh somebody took the nameplate Somebody took my nameplate. Oh, no, we're going to have to. I'm no longer kind of a big deal. Yeah, he's got a, his new nameplate. is kind of a big deal. I like it. <laughs> well, you know, also we have two other guests join us in the studio. And, um, you know, with the special guest that we have on the line here, I, I wanted to have a, a couple locals that have had experience with our guests. And. George Poveromo has uh, been here several times for Saltwater, his <laughs> seminar series. And Jason Burton, the Flounder Pounder from MIFC, has been a speaker there. And Captain Chris Osman has been a speaker as well. And uh, Captain Chris, you've got some uh, plans maybe in the future to oh, do, yeah. a sh- do a show with George. Exactly, this spring. Yep, so we're going to get coming. George. We're good. And so now let me introduce our guest, Stephen. I'll go ahead and do it. Uh, the one and only. 23 years, this man has been gracing the television uh, with his incredible personality. I mean, you, it, it's as genuine as you get. Uh, I think we'll all agree and attest to that, that yep. have had the experience of hanging out with him after the seminar series, um, that George is just an incredible talent on camera, 
off camera. He is as genuine a person as you'll meet. And uh, we're hoping for all those kind words that maybe our mailboxes will be full with Pampas Pilar. So yes. <laughs> with, without further ado, the one and only Mr. George Poveromo. And George, thank you for taking the time to join us on this beautiful Monday. Uh, well, it's beautiful in your area, but not here. Well, hey, well, well I appreciate you having me on the radio there and, and, and giving me such a uh, – award-winning uh, introduction. I think I could probably run for mayor and win with something like that. Well, we, we've got a couple people in the room here that are pretty good with politics. If you need any, if you need any help, come on over. We'll get you going. <laughs> yeah, we'll get you going over here. But I tell you, George, it, I go back to uh, – hang, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt you. But you got me thinking about something. I, I, George, Stephen Goldfinch yes. here. Good, good. Yes. Thanks for coming on the show. Um, a couple years ago, we started talking about ways to increase the visibility of Merle's Inlet. Merle's Inlet, uh, George, you might not know. Uh, George, have you ever been here? Uh, yes, I have. Oh, good. Okay, so you know, Merle's Inlet's sort of a, a little fishing village that blows yep. up with tourists in the summertime. Not, not a whole lot going on in the fall, winter, spring, but certainly blows up with tourists in the summertime. And we were thinking about a way to try to increase visibility for Merle's Inlet. The community was a, a few years ago in the fall. And they wanted, you know, they asked me what I thought. And I said, you know what I think would be a great idea? A cast net throwing contest for political candidates. <laughs> That's can, a great idea. Can you imagine the governor, you know, you know how governors come and do stumps, you yep. know, gov gubernatorial candidates or presidential candidates come and do stumps and they give speeches. Sure. I think we could do an oyster roast and a cast net throwing contest for the next gubernatorial candidates that come. I think it'd be a great well, idea. I'm well, to be a judge. Since, yeah, me too. Well, since Evil Knievel has passed away and we can't get a motorcycle jump artist, so you may have some wheels with that one. Yeah, exactly. I, I that would be fun. I would like to see Henry. Uh, I'd like to see old Henry throwing the cast net. Oh, they'd fail miserably, which would be part of the fun. That's right. right. I mean, but can you well, imagine I'll, the I'll, the political I'll, consultants? I'll give, you, I'll give you one thing here, yeah. which is probably a lesser known fact: okay. is I never, I don't know how to throw a cast net. I've never thrown a cast net at all. And the reason being, I've always run my own boat. I've had buddies with cast nets. I was the guy moving them on top of the fish to throw the nets and all that stuff. So there, there's a little less known fact there. How about that? <laughs> wow. How about that? Yeah, about but I, I've always run the boat. There was never, ever a need for me to do that. All, you know, a lot of my buddies throw the net. So I run the boat. I get the boat in skinny where we need to to get the baits. And I'm so busy maneuver it to make sure we get them where they need to be and if we're really skinny not get stuck in there and get out after they throw the net that i've never ever you know i've never even taken a net out in my driveway or backyard to even try it did, that's did, uh did you did you like start fishing uh, offshore fishing saltwater fishing as a young child and and the reason i ask is because i noticed that people that start later in life do not throw the cast net because they just don't want to learn a new trick. You know, I think that's the bottom line is they don't want to learn. No, I, I, I started at a young age. Did um, you? In fact, I, my father was a dentist uh, in Bay Harbor, which is Miami beach. Yeah. And my earliest recollections go back to like six or so years old. He used to take me on the seawall, Biscayne Bay and catch his little snappers and grunts. And that's where everything got hooked up for me. And then he had a boat, and he liked the bottom fish with groupers and snappers. And then when I was getting old enough to go out with him and do that, you know, that's what we did. And then, you know, growing up and cutting my teeth, you know, I grew up with snook and uh, tarpon and trout in Biscayne Bay. And then once I got my driver's license, I was able to pull the family's boat by myself. I got buddies, and we just started sneaking offshore. You know, my dad said never, ever go out there because the, the, the boat had a single engine, and it wasn't really a, an offshore boat. But that that's where my passion was so shoot i've been offshore fishing i mean before that with my dad but uh, seriously from 16 years old and that that's what i consider my expertise and forte and i've just chased that passion you know going way back then so uh i'm i, I guess i'm one of what they call a grizzled veteran of the game you know so you you've been fishing out of miami for 50 plus years 55 years yeah that would that would be correct yep uh, so you've seen a lot yeah. of, you've seen a lot of change yes i have and and on uh, but yeah without a doubt some fisheries are doing tremendously well others are okay our big thing down here is uh is water quality yeah. it, it, it has become so bad and it's just like 
band-aids everywhere nobody addresses the real true problems and you know bit, you know not to harp and put a a, a a dark cloud on it but just biscayne bay where i grew up had the most lush grasses in there for sea trout and everything now it's just you know north biscayne bay for the majority of it's just mud and um is that and, is that the fertilizer plant remind me what the problem down there is sure plants? And, and then see what people don't understand and this is something we, we were on a, a a reef committee here that uh that had just ended we were on it for about three years and they want to know what they could do to try to save the reefs yeah. and the scary thing is that from south florida from stewart down to the upper florida keys Okay, the Keys reefs are a little better shape, but, but we only have 2% of our coral reefs that are still alive. Wow. And they're trying to figure it, you know, and they're talking about all these different solutions. And then a lot of us argue what, because they can't relate to it. All that problem starts inshore with the fresh waters. I grew up as a kid, you know, when I was, you know, going to school, bank fishing for largemouth bass in the Biscayne River Canal in North Miami. And back then, when the sides would get a little overgrown with weeds and brush, they would have a barge come in and they would manually cut all that. And the second barge would load all the clippings and, and cuts onto that. That's how they took care of that. And since then, now what happens, they spray chemicals. You see these barges coming down, they spray chemicals on the weeds to kill them. They fall in there. That chemical kills any kind of grasses within those canals. And that, that water, when the rains come up, we have dams. They open that water when the canals get high. All that tainted water goes into the Biscayne Bay. And then where, what the people don't understand with the reefs is the outgoing tide takes this water and it contributes to a lot of the other factors that have uh, contributed to demise of the coral reefs. And going back to what you said, yes, uh, the homes that have not that are on the water that have not been converted to sewers, they have septic tanks, and a lot of those septic tanks are old and aging and leaking, and a lot of that seeps into those freshwater canals and into the bay, as well as fertilizer. When they fertilize the grasses, that also goes in. So you have a you know a triple cocktail that has been ongoing, and uh, then. That's my area, South Florida. You start moving up to Palm Beach, Stewart, and you got Lake Okeechobee is basically uh, uh, just a cesspool of pollutants from the sugar and, and all that, and not to get any political battles, but all that water makes it into our bays. Look what happened to Stewart. The, the biggest sea trout in the state used to come from there. They had lush grasses, mud in most of those areas now. That goes offshore. That hits our reefs. That contributes with a lot of other factors. and. Uh, so my long-winded answer, a lot of people don't understand, a lot of those problems start inshore with our freshwater canals. And are they, are they still doing that spraying today? Yes. We've been arguing this in an ad, and, they can, and then they come up. That's well, crazy. We have, we, they have, deep, they have not, like spray units where they can only allow X amount of volume in those canals to spray, and they have to stop. And what it is, it, 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 it's cheaper. Instead of having people go out on the bars like you used to manually yeah. clip those in these canals and – you know, why not go the other way, put some more people to work that want to do that and why, but it's terrible. And, and you can't eat the fish, you know, you, you eat a freshwater fish too much. You're going to glow. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Here we are two weeks in a row talking about spraying and this effects. Yeah, I know. Right. We were talking about this with uh, duck hunt last, last week or the week before. And it was, it's such a detrimental thing to the to the duck habitat for us here in South Carolina. Yep. That, I mean, we're going, we're trying to go in the opposite direction now. Sort of surprised that they haven't, who's advocating? I mean, I, I guess these are, these are people in Florida that, you know, utilize these canals on a regular basis that are advocating for the spraying still. Uh, no, it's the government, Yeah, the government, you know, the counties and, and then probably beyond that, it's probably in the states they look at budgets and they hey do the spraying it's cheaper you put one guy out or two guys in the bars they spray each side of it and yeah. it's done and there's no second bar wow. there's no manual labor to chop these things and and then understand that they kill themselves and and and, the, and again coming from a native south Virginia, okay i was born and raised in miami moved to broward county about 25 years ago the the water here is what draws tourism to our state That's right. we're a big tourist state this is what People come to South Florida. They love the beaches. 
they love the lakes they love the fishing they love all this and we're just going to poison it to the point where it just gets so bad that once you get a place like cuba if that ever becomes free south florida is going to go away everyone's going to bypass this area or florida and they're going to go down there for the novelty uh and unless they messed up all the waters down there they're going to have what florida used to have and, and we're going to get it in the long run here yeah it, it's just so <laughs> short-sighted i mean it, it might be cheaper today but it's certainly going to be a lot more expensive tomorrow when you realize the tourism is disappearing and the fishing industry is disappearing which has i mean that happens to be a huge economic driver for us yes. i'm sure it's a yes. giant economic driver for y'all <laughs> And yep. I mean, and you know, I, I, it's like everything else. I think it, locals recognize it first, uh, outsiders recognize it last, but I mean, I'm an outsider to Florida and I've, I've been recognizing it for a couple of years now. Oh, we have as, too. As a huge yeah. problem. Yep. And so I know it's been going, it had to have been going on for years if I'm just now recognizing it a few years ago. Well, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at a Hell's Bay Boatworks uh, coffee mug because the guy, two guys in front of me went on a tour of the plant. We did. A couple of weeks ago. And one thing that has brought us closer to it, Jason and I obviously both uh, run Key West Boats. Key West Boats hopped on board three years ago with Captains for Clean Water. And they have been in, uh, <laughs> participating in that crazy, crazy, uh, uh, hang on one second. Okay, hang up. Hang on. Sorry, I got a phone call coming through. Anyway, they've been participating uh, in that crazy race to raise money yep. for Catmans for Clean Water. Um, and that is where I became uh, obviously uh, completely uh, educated on what's going on down there as far as the water. Um, and it's been great to see all the money uh, that has been raised from Hell's Bay, Sea Pro, uh, so forth, so on, all the companies, uh, Key West, that are involved in that race. But um, it, it, ca captains for clean water. Captains for clean yeah. water. Yep. George, you familiar with them? I'm sure. Yes, I am. They're they're, they're a very good group, and and uh, they're really active and and really dialed into that. You know, we have a, a few conservation groups down here, and each one really specializes in in a certain interest, like CCA Florida. Uh, they they're more in protecting the fisheries and and trying to keep a good balance there, and and not so much uh, in the clean water side of it to to promote the fight there and. And I, I serve as their offshore spokesperson for CCA Florida. And it's, you know, they're all about the fishes and they don't get involved in a clean water deal. Uh, they, although they, they'll, they'll talk about it, but they don't get really involved. Whereas Captain for Clean Water is the group that goes directly into that arena and that's all they promote. So uh, it's like when you join conservation groups, it's like sort of betting on horses, the horse race. You got to put your money on two or three horses and hope one of them comes in at the end. That, that's correct. Do you do you do you feel like Captains for Clean Water is making some headway? Yeah. They are, and but the, and and they're still a small group. They they're aggressive with it. They're getting a lot of good money behind them with, with corporate type sponsors, and they just need to really grow that momentum because they're on it. They you know there are a lot of captains that make their their living in the backcountry in the Florida Keys, which a lot of that tainted water, a lot of that uh, those grasses back there are are damaged and. Uh, and, and if they're doing the good fight it, and, and they're getting that in their back country, but there's so many more people in the state all the way up that are at the same, you know, crossroads. And I, and I would like to see them get even larger and I'm sure that they will, but you know, like anything else, it's, uh, it, they're up and coming and you'd like to see them like super, super strong with millions of members, but hopefully one day they get that way and, you know, they make a lot of noise and. Um, you know, they get involved in the political aspect of it too, which I guess you got to do uh, to try to get anything done these days. And, but that is a good group. That's, that's you know, a long way to answer. You know, we had a, a very, on a much, much smaller scale, a similar thing happening here in Merle's Inlet. We've got a Merle's Inlet watershed program where we try to keep the waters of Merle's Inlet super clean. We, we pull a lot of oysters from here. And mm -hmm. anyway, one of the things that was going on years ago was they were spraying the, um, the medians in the roads and the interstates, uh, I mean, the roads, Highway 17 and business and bypass. Yeah. And they were concerned about runoff into the ditches, which eventually end up in the marsh. And one of the best ways from a political, you know, a guy that's steeped in, in politics, one of the best ways to start getting people's attention is you, you invest the people that can make money out of the deal. I mean, that's the way you do it. And it sounds sort of, ooh, that doesn't sound no. quite right. But 
the people that can make money out of the deal, when you when you take the spraying out of the medians, are the people that cut the medians, right? Because they've got to cut yep. they got to cut the medians more. So you invest those guys in the process. You get them going to the, to the state house to lobby and to the county governments to lobby, and all of a sudden stuff starts changing. I mean, grassroots stuff is great, and it, I mean, it's in grassroots. What I mean by that is, you know, the actual organization, Captains for Clean Water. We had the same. We had the same organization here. You know, a very similar organization different, different here. Name. Different name, but nothing changed. Until you got the grass cutter guys, the guys that are cutting the big DOT contractors, the Department of Transportation contractors. When you get them invested because they know they're going to make more money, they go to lobbying and all of a sudden stuff changes. No, you're, you're dead on. And that had been brought up with our situation with the spraying. And it was brought up that, well, you know, the government, they've got their county people or whatever spraying and, you know, they're on the payroll and yeah. what have you. And they says. Why don't you get the these independents that are out there, uh, you know, independent contractors that have barges that may cut this thing, and you pay them X amount to go and do these things, and, and, and they're independent contractors. You don't have to carry them on full-time or anything like that. Right. In the long run, it'd be way better for that environment. It'll be a, a little bit less impact maybe on the budget. I don't know how that how that would work, but, yeah, you're definitely on to that. And, um and it should work. And, and going back to the dirty water thing is you look at these inshore canals and lakes and everything we have here. And as I mentioned, I spent a lot of time on foot fishing the banks of the Biscayne River Canal for bass and all that stuff. How many kids do you have in South Florida? They get off school and they come down and they'll grab their friend they'll go to a local canal or go to a local lake here and catch some fish. And, you know, that's just a, a, a solid playground for these kids to do this at, at very little cost and to get them hooked into our sport and you want to make sure that you have clean waters and and i and i and i hope that nobody's really keeping these fish for consumption and because if they are you know that it, it, it'd be really risky to eat them but you, you look at the whole base that you have for the kids that come after school that could really enjoy these water sports and get hooked up on fishing and 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 be future stewardess or stewards of our industry i mean those those are the future there and you know rather than give them a polluted cesspool we need to clean that up and let them enjoy it and do what i did growing up fishing the banks and and, and i used to take those fish and eat them and that's probably what's wrong with me today if you take the things back. <laughs> it's a much better solution than tiktok let's put it let's put it that way that it is i mean that is. these kids nowadays are just they're surrounded by social media and the internet and cell phones and computers and iPads and tablets and and uh I, I swear it's destroying society I, I mean I'm please I'll, I'll I agree I'm pointing it myself I'm gonna I'll get off keep of, going I'm gonna get off a of soapbox no you can minute, go but go I mean, they the the world is going to hell on roller skates <laughs> there is no better way to put it but uh every single day you know I, I struggle with this with my kid my kids are six almost seven and nine and I mean, from the day they were born, they were inundated with screens, yep. you know, and we don't even have them. Like I, I do not give my kids a phone. I do not, do not give my kids an iPad, but they know how to run YouTube better than I do. <laughs> right? It's just naturally it's around everywhere around them. And we have to proactively like go to them and say, let yesterday, perfect example. Yesterday they're sitting around watching YouTube at whatever time, you know, and I say, we're getting in the car, we're getting in the truck, and we're driving to the farm, we're taking your motorcycles, and you're going to ride your motorcycles around the farm all day long. Yep. You're going to get muddy, we're going to take the dog, you're going to fall, you're going to get hurt, you're going to scrape your knee, you're going to fuss, and you're going to fight, and we're going to have a great time doing it. Sign that, me and Chris up, we want to go. Yeah. That gummit, <laughs> that gummit, you're going to have a great time doing it, whether you like it or not. So, count me in. you got to just, pro, like, proactively drill into them every single day, get outside get outside because they're inundated with that stuff and if they don't y'all i'm telling you it's the end of the world it hey. is the end of the world george kept i mean george you're so perfect and spot on you know there is a you know a, i lived in florida for a while i played golf professionally and lived up in the orlando area and uh, while i didn't appreciate fishing as much back then if i wasn't on the golf course i was at a bar but uh i i, I wish i lived i wish i could go back and live the places that i lived in orlando area 
and, and realized what was in the ponds that I was living on. And I did see kids, so many kids out there fishing. And, and you know, when it comes to the accessibility of saltwater and freshwater in Florida, I mean, every kid probably has no excuse that they cannot go wet a line down there yeah. Yeah. in some sure. capacity. Uh, sure. And, and a lot, and a lot still do. Exactly. And and I wanted to go back real quick. You were talking earlier because the couple times that I've been to Florida, I filmed a couple shows down there myself. I, I was fortunate to film with, I think, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Greg Bogdan. I'm, I'm, I think oh, you're. Oh, yeah. No, I've known Greg forever. Yep. And uh, filmed with Greg there out of Selfish Marina. And I'm looking back. I was in uh, Fort Pierce and filmed there, filmed down in Isla Mirada. And I don't recall seeing a lot of oysters in any of the areas that i was and i'm asking because am i being stupid do y'all have oysters and they, they you do start to get around that central florida area but as a as a as an aside as a kid you know when you used to go to the boat ramps and and you used to see there there were certain oyster uh spots out of south florida miami where they existed way back then but then the water quality you know there wasn't enough of them that to to, to the filter and all that and you, you know they're they're long gone so the oysters you're going to start seeing maybe more of an abundance as you start working your way to uh central florida in that part of the world versus you know extreme south florida so that was you, you knew exactly where i was going with that I, I i know that it is the most important part of, of our estuary system here yes and uh, uh i'm like okay so how about we just go figure out how to produce oysters or, or, or build oyster beds and, and uh, you start putting oyster beds and, and spending time putting those in down there. But from what you're saying is they don't have a, a chance to survive because the pollution is already so high. Well, they're, they're starting to try that a bit now. I know with Fort Lauderdale, there's been talk about starting to do the oyster uh, planting there. And, you know, I would assume that if you could get enough of them in there, that it would certainly be a, a big help. And, you know, you get in the back country of the Florida Keys and, Certain places that you fish out at Everglades, you know, you've got the oyster bars and in, in, in the in the beds there. Um, so there's no reason why they couldn't really thrive again. Uh, but again, in our area, other than here in Fort, Fort Lauderdale, you don't hear too much of a press or pressing to go ahead and and try to plant them in there and let them filter feed and, and clean the waters. And and you know, it sort of segues into that reef thing that um, the committee that we were on and. Um, it, you know, one of the, the thoughts they wanted to go ahead and just reseed the coral reefs. And they found that what has happened is that the, the warming waters have been killing these corals, that, that they can't thrive in, in, in the warming waters, these higher acidic levels. And, and so unless they can breed a super coral that's impervious to the warmer temperatures and in the, um, the higher acidic levels, you know, why would you go ahead and replant what already can't make it out there and um and on a more aggressive standpoint one person on the committee had a, had an excellent idea and he says why are we all trying to figure out how to save two percent of the reef when 98 percent is gone we should be looking at how do you redesign reefs to give these fish their structure their, in, in their prime spawning zones you know the mangrove snapper the mutton snappers the groupers and he had a good thing, and, and that was lining up solid, like concrete type structures that you could run parallel in certain depth zones where a lot of these fish had their key spawns. And if you lay those out alongside the, the reefs that still exist, you know, nothing's going to kill the concrete. They'll eventually grow algae and all that, and it will provide some kind of relief that these fish could get on and start spawning. And so that idea was sort of taken off too. And, you know, what are we doing trying to fight to save 2% and maybe you've got to rethink this thing and, and come out with something totally different. Well, I'm, I'm sure you're aware you, I know you fish with John Owens and there's other South Carolina guys you fish with, but our complete reef structure here is all man-made uh, for yes. the most part. Yes. Uh, made up of concrete, made up of, uh, decommissioned military vessels uh, made up of uh, air landing craft um, all kinds of stuff here um, and it seems to do seems to do well here I mean absolutely it's... it provides a habitat for the the fish and it replaces the natural habitat which may or may not really be that solid anymore in an area and it 
without a doubt, West Palm Beach Fishing Club has put down these giant cement darts out there very successfully. And what they've been doing is they've not even go, gone to the reefs. They're going into these areas of just dead bottom where there's just sand or mud and there's no structure. And they've been setting these down there. And all of a sudden now, because there's structure, no dead zone, there's bait, there's game fish coming through them again. And so they're not even working on the regular reefs, but just putting these in dead areas, even out deep. And all of a sudden they're fish attractors and it just has more habitat for these fish to come around and do their spawning. And it, it so it, it, it all works. It, you know, that's the yeah, way it is. Yeah. That, and that's, and that's the way you should do it. I mean, we, we have, um, I, it's probably similar, but we have a, a system in South Carolina where a one square mile area is permitted for an artificial reef. And mm -hmm. it's very difficult for our state's DNR to get the Corps of Engineers to permit new new permit sites. So what they'll do is they'll dump, you know, a million APCs or reef balls or whatever these concrete pyramid, you know, reef structures that we're talking about. They'll dump a million of these in this one square mile area. And I keep telling them, I say, guys, that, that's great. I appreciate you dumping additional material, but where we really need material is out in the dead zones. You mm -hmm. know, the places that are nothing but, I mean, we, we've got an area sort of to the north out of Merle's Inlet, to the north and east out of Merle's Inlet, that's just like a 20 square mile area of sand. And I mean, there's a couple of wrecks in the middle of it, but nothing else. I mean, if you find a rock the size of my desk, it's going to be covered with fish. I mean, just absolutely mm -hmm. covered with fish because it's in the middle of the desert. That's where you got to put these things. That's where you've got to find, I mean, piling them on one on top of another on top of another, you know, eventually there's diminishing returns. You've got, sure, absolutely. you know, you got to put them in those dead, dead zones. Mm -hmm. So love that y'all are doing that. We do have coral reefs, by the way, English. We have coral reefs. They're just deep water coral, what I call deep water coral. We, we obviously don't have hardly any reef structure within three right. or four miles of the, of the beach. Right. We do have the poly, you know, the Polly's Island Reef. Yep. It's actually got coral on it. Oh, does it? A lot of them do. Yeah. The there, there's a little section um, up there by Spring Bay Pier that's natural. Yeah, too. that's right. That's right. But most of our corals, like actual coral that you'll see, is in 100 plus foot of water. Mm -hmm. we've, we've, got a, mm -hmm. um, we've got some really interesting coral out at the Georgetown Hole area, anywhere from like 160 foot to 200 foot of water, where we've got these big white corkscrew coral pieces of coral that'll come off the bottom 20 or 30 feet up into the oh, air. Oh, nice. Very nice. cool, very cool. But all that's deep water. And then I just heard Noah had released a publication that we've got the largest deep water coral reef. It's in like 2,000 plus feet of water off of South Carolina. Really? Wow. Wow. So I didn't know that. giant, like a giant, giant barrier reef, but out in deep water. And it runs from the bottom of the state all the way up to North Carolina. Wow. So pretty cool, but 2,000 feet of water. Hey, George, in case you didn't notice by Steve's descrip Stephen's description, um, he spends as much, if not more, time under the water than he does in the boat. I do. Well, that's, that, that's a worthy observation, and I'm thinking, wow, number one, you have more coral reefs than we do now, and I'm thinking of that 2,000-foot zone there. That's a be a good uh, daytime drop for swordfish. swordfish. You know there's got to be yep. some, some a lot of life in there, and if you got the life, you got those deep water pelagics going in there to feed on them. So I've I've become fascinated with daytime sword fishing. I I really yes. I, I suck we, at it. We uh, we've had <laughs> your we've had uh, your mutual friends Nick Stanzik and Bouncer on yeah. the show, and Stephen picked their brain the entire hour, uh, both <laughs> of them about sword fishing, and uh, Stephen is definitely obsessed with it. I am, and I don't I don't blame you, Stephen. That is. And, and there's a marked difference between the way that we used to do it at night before you realize that you yeah. can do this in the daytime to hooking a sword at night and going through it and catching it. It's a marked difference to hook them in the day to see if they jump and to look down and get that first glimpse of that cobalt purple back as you're working. I mean, it's just the most magnificent sight and the most magnificent fish. And of all the billfish, it's the most intelligent because what they know if you hook them, they know where the trouble's coming from, and they often try to deal with it. It's a very aggressive fish that they've attacked boats, and, you know, whereas you get a blue marlin or a sailfish, and it jumps, and say the boat just happens to be in a way, they're not intentionally trying to target the boat. Right. They're just doing what their instinct tells them to do, but the swordfish is an entirely different animal. It, it knows where the situation is, and, and a lot of times it tries to deal with it. 
Well, I need to get you down here to, to te- up here to teach me how to do it one of these days because I'm I've been unsuccessful thus far. We did catch one. Um, we we made three drops, caught one. Actually, the very first drop caught one, and got him to the back of the boat. Seventy five got to the leader. He ran up underneath the motors. Two sharks ran him up underneath the motors. Oh. Two duskies ran right down both sides of the boat, ran right straight to him. He stretched out underneath the motors, and they ate him behind the boat. And oh, boy, that hurts that close. Oh, uh-huh. it did just, it killed, oh, it was, it killed because it took, you know, a good hour and a half, hour, 45 minutes to get, and, to and get him just, up. And just so you know, George, uh, how, how, how small the world really is, he had another former speaker from your seminar series on the boat with him that day, Captain Jay Bache. Yeah. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Which, by the way, I got a I got a beef to pick with seminar series. Oh, oh. go ahead. I think I got a good answer for you too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> no, I mean, why why not? So, English in, English in, uh, mentioned earlier. I'm a I'm a big spear fisherman. I I enjoy the perspective of underwater as as much as I do above it, or more than I do above it. And I do think it makes you a better fisherman when you can see the way that fish react so we, when you can see the way that fish pile up on a certain piece of ledge down, you know, let's say down current, sometimes it's weird and they'll pile up on, on the up current side, you know, to see the way that grouper stage underneath bait, to see the way that snapper stage over bait, to see the way that trigger fish stage up high and the water column over a ledge. When you see this stuff and you can sort of put it all together in your head and you pull up on the ledge when you're fishing and you say, I've, I've been here. I know exactly what's going on. I can tell you that's amberjack. I can tell you that's triggerfish. I can tell you that's X, Y, and Z. And here's what we got to do in order to get past the amberjack to get to the grouper. I mean, why why not incorporate a little more of that into the saltwater series? I I, I knew he well, was going there. Yep, and and I've got the answer for you. What okay. you had said about going down that is unparalleled education. When you see the fish interacting within their environment and what they do that that that's a super super awesome education that tells you a lot about what's going on down there and areas where fish hang out now i've always said that people who spear fish don't know how to catch them on regular rod and reels so <laughs> we, we keep that <laughs> oh boy well there might i mean there may be some truth to that because they just no don't no I'm, I'm saying that in a, in a in a joking manner it's it's like people say hey do you golf yeah well that's like saying well golfers they golf because they don't know how to fish that's just sort of a little aside uh, <laughs> like joke that. there but I, I always thought too is that yeah it, it is an, uh, an art all into itself but i don't uh care for it too much because i don't it, I, in a way, I think it's cheating in a, in a bit because mm-hmm. when you fish rod and reel, you've got to find the spot. You've got to get through certain fish. Okay, then once you get down there, you have to figure out what it's going to take to get these fish to eat if they're not eating aggressively. Is it a bait change? Do I need to scale down a leader? Do I need to go with a smaller hook? You work at trying to coax a fish into striking. And then once you do, you fight the fish off. It has a shot of getting away during the fight. Once you get it to the boat, it has another shot that either if it's not the right size or, or, or whatever, you're going to let it go. Or if you have a, a fish box full or if it's a closed season, you're going to release it. So there are all these different opportunities for that fish to sort of beat you. Whereas you get them in the, in the, in the crosshairs of a spear gun and boom, it's over with right there. So, <laughs> it, you know, it's all, all depends on what side of the fence you're on. No, so, you know, I, I agree with you. And Stephen and I, uh, when I was in my early 40s and Stephen would have been in his early 30s, late 20s, finishing law school. And uh, we had many internet arguments, uh, the two of us, uh, over this. Same topic. <laughs> so so I've, I've heard <laughs> we I've, did. I've heard you. I think I heard you say it on your show one time that it was cheating. Oh, yeah. There, yes. With uh, um, definitely with Scott Wenzel and uh, a good friend of mine. He's also a camera crew guy. And then I did a show with him this that aired this season. And I always rag on him because he's a really good spear fisherman. Yeah. And then I always rag on him, tease him the whole bit. But uh, he does learn, going back to what you said with his diving, about wahoo and in the fish that we were catching on that episode i don't know if you saw the yellow jacks the big yellow jack right which i did they're like a you know you get them that's like a rare catch he says when he's diving there's a certain wreck or two wrecks in his area that when he's diving there are hundreds upon hundreds of yellow jacks that size class 
that just do big, large circles and, and that the perimeter of those wrecks. Mm-hmm. And people think that they're an incidental catch, that they're, oh, man, we got a yellow jacket. That's right. Hey, you don't see too many of those. But he said there's a couple wrecks where they think that they're fond of, and there are areas of around these wrecks, I should say, where they're hundreds upon hundreds of them in that size. Then he sees schools of Wahoo, large schools of Wahoo, where he said he sees 50 to 100 fish schools making large, long circles mm-hmm. around certain wrecks at certain times. So seeing that gives you that whole nother advantage of where these fish may be or what they do in certain tide stages. And that helps you become a better angler to target them with rod and reel, of course. <laughs> yeah. So I, I grew up when I, when, when I was a young, young kid, we had a boat and it had a, um, I wish I could remember. It seemed like it was a Simtex. Anyway, Cytex. Oh, right? Yeah. It was old Cytex uh, bottom big machine. Big green unit, right? Green big, unit. Big green unit. And it actually, the one before that, it actually burned onto the piece of paper. paper. And it yeah, it's like up the stylus. Yeah, Absolutely. and it spit it out on a little piece of paper like a reg- <laughs> like a cash register spitting it out. And my uh-huh. dad my dad would look at that thing and he'd say, I, I think there's a wreck there. Or I think there's a ledge there. And I can remember getting so excited looking at this little teeny piece of paper trying to figure it out. And now today... You've got a giant, I don't know, what do you use on your mock? What do you have? Mark? Simrad. you got a giant Simrad. Simrad. Yeah, it's a 24-inch Simrad. I mean, yep. you can see a fish You can see a fish fart from 2,000 feet below. How's that not cheating? It, yep. it, well, because you still have to catch that fish that's 2,000 feet below. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm just or, giving you or, a hard time. Or you find a guy with good lungs that can hold his breath and go down and spear him, one of the two. <laughs> yeah, I'm, give, I'm giving you a hard time. I, no, I, no, it is. I that's know funny, you're giving though, me a hard time. It is, it, it, but it, it's, it's amazing when you have that screen like that. And I joke, people say, how big is that screen? Because that, it really amazes everybody that you've got that in that center console. And I, I just tell them I got a good deal from a drive-in movie theater that was closing down. Yeah, and, uh, exactly. But, but it's when you could see that large, the, 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 the definition at the bottom, it, and it's amazing what you, what you really could see when it's that big. And, of course, maybe it's the fact that you're – you know, I'm getting older too, and you, you know, you need a bigger thing to see again. You know, Amen. your eyes not as what they used to be, but it's it's amazing what what you could see with that and the chirp technology for target separation. It's, you know, we're running equipment now, electronics now. There were probably only the the big cruise ships had you know, or freighters probably 30 years ago. You know, it's, yeah. it's amazing how advance this is for our league of fishing electronics all right i'm gonna give one more defense of spear fishing and then i'm gonna be done with it <laughs> I'll, I'll probably have one more good rebuttal but that's, go a, that's okay I, I think i think where people get stirred up on this is that um it's called spear fishing it really english made this point a few weeks ago it's not fishing it's hunting it's hunting it's hunting yeah. it's hunting underwater and if we were to separate the two by you know by calling it spear hunting i think we would probably see a different result here but it's truly it's not fishing it does give you the perspective you want okay the perspective you want to become a better fisherman but it's not fishing it's hunting because you're looking for one particular fish which is why i like spear fishing because you can literally go down and pick out the biggest best eating fish on the reef and you don't have any bycatch that comes along with it exactly you know i don't need to go through 10 or 12 big gag grouper little gag grouper you know that half will die before i get the big gag grouper i go down i find the big gag grouper if i can catch him if he doesn't get under a ledge if he doesn't ghost out into the sand if a red snapper doesn't eat him (laughs) yeah if a red snapper doesn't eat but i mean i go and i pick out the one big gag grouper and i shoot it and that's spear hunting it's not so much fishing so i I think there's a distinction. I don't think there's a competition, but there shouldn't be a competition between fish. No, and, and then, you know, you're, you're, you're doing in a, in, a, in a, a, a conservative, responsible manner, too. Now, where this gets abused, especially on the west side of our state down here, is you have commercial spear mm-hmm. uh, gun divers. And, they'll, they, and they systematically work all those wrecks and bottom pieces. And they'll go down and, and they'll shoot every single thing, whether it's barracuda, you name it, mm-hmm. and they just obliterate. A wreck yeah. and they you know naturally they sell it there's a market for that and then once they beat up on one wreck they'll move off the next day to a second one or third one and circle back around to the one that they started off with several days later when it has time to repopulate itself and they'll bang permit they'll 
you know, that's just a, a gross abuse. And you know, I can understand why that that's still legal. Rod and real commercial fishermen. Fantastic. You know that, you know, they're out there and they're going to earn their living and they're not really hurting the overall population of the fish. But once you get to something that aggressive, you know, it's like long lining. Um, you know, gill nets, which we had banned in our waters years ago. It's, I think it's some form of, of, of fishing that, that should be limited um, because it's so, so destructive in the wrong hands. Yeah. Well, you just filmed, you just filmed it. Well, you just aired a show that you filmed with, uh, with all of our buddies, Jod Owens. And we were just, uh, Chris and I were just in North Carolina last week, duck hunting. And uh, the, the two bodies of water that we duck hunted on, the, the guide had to, maneuver between those pound nets up there uh the the, the flounder well they say they catch everything in it don't they yeah. redfish trout they, they're able to everything. sell trout up there see we we come we have no commercial fishery for trout or redfish in south carolina praise the lord uh, and there is a mm-hmm. very minimal uh for flounder and it is only as a bycatch on some boats yeah. but the pound nets up there oh, were incredible terrible. yeah they're Crazy. terrible it's, it's a shame yeah. a total shame they're their own worst enemy they are. Yeah, and, and I'll throw North Carolina under the bus for this. Thank Here's you. The state. <laughs> yeah, Here's the North state. Carolina's the state. That's the problem. I fish it all the time. The, yep. That state up there has the potential to, be, to become the number one saltwater recreational fishing state, okay, in the country with their estuaries, and, and but they continue to do all the netting. If those nets were outlawed and those trout had time to really – populate and get really large nobody would go to texas anymore to catch big trout nobody would go where they used to go in stewart before we had mud flats that was the best place again in florida to get big trout they would go to north carolina because you have the right environment in there and it's just so many excellent fisheries that that state has but they're so heavily into large-scale commercial interest that you don't under i guess they're so ingrained uh, politically from commercial fishing families and influences that if they just understood how much recreational angling could bring to that economy where people would go up there to fish, they'd rent the hotels, they'd rent the charter boats, they'd buy skiffs, they'd buy motors, they'd buy rod and reels. And they say, what about the guys that do the nets? What are you going to do with them? Well, a lot of those anglers, a lot of those commercial anglers know the habits and where these fish will be. They could easily convert over and become skiff guys, whatever, and take people the rod and reel, they'll make their big money at the end of the day, whether or not to catch fish or not, because they're in that charter type business at that point in time. And, and they would go ahead uh, and be able to, uh, you know, some of them spin off and pick up that type of a career as well. And it's just, uh, it just always leaves me scratching my head <laughs> what goes on yeah, up there. We, we need to bring you to one of those meetings up there when we talk about all that gill netting up in North Carolina. I've seen it so many times where I'll pull up and it's the gill netters abusing their privilege. They'll have a creek and they'll box off every creek in there, every m- creek mouth, and just take everything out of there. And there's no size. I mean, I've seen overslot redfish dead in the net. I've seen monster trout. I've seen juvenile trout. I mean, just uh, if there's not a way of calling that size fish, I, I don't understand how you can still do it. It's just an abuse of practice. And, mm-hmm. it, and uh, so, it, it, like I said, I, and I <coughs> talked over there at our seminars when we've had, you know, we, the, we put the CCA out there in the lobby area and we, we just make it a point. I mean, shoot, back we had the gill nets. Uh, out of South Florida, pretty much decimated everything till we put it to a vote and had them outlawed. And it, it's amazing how it, in a few short years, how much more bait had come back in. The Spanish mackerel started showing up again. The king started showing up in full force. The snook, it, to everything just bounced back. And before that, it was, uh, if you were able to get a, uh, you know, you catch a snook, wow that would make headlines that day and then spanish mackerel runs which you could set your watch by they were long gone mm-hmm. when all that was going on and it's uh it, it's just a mindset and and that recreational angling brings just so much more into that economy um it's just you know what are you going to do it's frustrating because uh, i mean it's been proven it, it's been proven that it will help the environment and all those fish if you just cut it out and they yeah. just turn the show like they just don't care 
that the family that we were staying with, the lodge that we were with and paying, that's what they, I mean, they, trust me, uh, t- tomorrow's the last day of duck season. Mm-hmm. They'll take their boat and completely convert it back, and they'll be back to running traps and crab pots. That's, yep. uh, that's uh-huh. And they've been doing it there, I think they're the third generation. So it, to them, it's, I don't want to say it's all they know, but it's, yeah. it's all they know. I mean, I and, wish they mm-hmm. would just limit it just to start off, just to have netting zones where you can just – Push them into a certain area where maybe you can wean them out instead of just cutting it off on them too, just to get everything going back to normal. Yep. Well, this is typical of our trilogy outdoors, by the way, George. And we, we, you know, we could call George and just talk world of saltwater fishing for hours upon hours. And so we kind of do like to dive in a little bit deeper and talk about other stuff. But I do. It's. I mean, we've got to talk about world of saltwater fishing. Twenty three years, uh, an incredible television series. Um, seen on Discovery Channel now. You've been on several different. You've been all over the markets. You were. I, I remember NBC Sports. You were on. Uh, were you ever on ESPN? Yeah, I, I thought a, so. We have, a, we have a standing joke. We started on ESPN two. We got uh, picked up there, and we spent our first ten years with ESPN two until ESPN got all the outdoor shows contracts to expire on the on on the set year. And once they did, they, they canceled all the outdoors. They got out of the outdoors. Then we were picked up three days later by NBC Sports. And we were with them for nine years until the same thing. They dropped all their outdoor programming. And then we ended up now, which we are at now, Discovery. And we've been there, I think, maybe two or three years. And uh, so we have a standing joke that we were out the networks have been around so long. Well, well that, that's for sure. And, and but. The show is incredible. We love it. And, um, you know, so many different, um, uh, I don't want to say incredible personalities, but, yes, incredible personalities you fish with uh, through the years. And, uh, you know, the one thing I want to know is, did you, I mean, your dad was a dentist. What yes. you, you said earlier that you got, you were five years old. It was a science experiment before we went on air. But what, <laughs> in, what in the world made you want to start sharing all your experiences on the water? Well, because I didn't want to be a dentist. Yeah. My, 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 my dad had this ingrained that his, his sons had to become a dentist. My uh, younger brother had gone on to become a dentist, and I wasn't cut out for that. You know, once he took me fishing, uh, I got that in my blood. And, and it's funny because nobody else in the family, maybe outside of him, uh, I'm talking about my daughters today and, and, you know, my young grandkids have that. So it was sort of a weird genetic thing that was passed from my dad to me, but I just had to be around the water. I had a fish, and it was something I had just done growing up. I, I never stayed to do school sports. None of that interests me. I just could not wait to get back from school get, and walk to the local canal and bass fish, wait for the weekends, get out there with my dad, and and that just consumed me as, as a sport. And, um, you know, my dad kept saying, you need to go to dental school, all this stuff. And, and then he finally realized that I wasn't really fit out for it. So he said, well, you're going to go to get an education. You're going to be an attorney. You're going to do something. So but believe it or not, I had graduated from the University of Miami. And the funny thing about that was, I, you know, you picked your courses and I didn't want to do anything that hard. So I said, well, look at this broadcast journalism stuff. That looks like pretty fun. And then I realized that I could put my courses on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I said, heck, if I want to go out on a Tuesday or Thursday, I could do that. So my mindset was that. And I, and I started taking those courses. And if somebody told me then that I would be doing what I am doing right now, I would call them a bold face liar. The only reason <laughs> I even took that, because it was the easiest courses to try to get a degree. And uh, I got my degree in it. And, uh, and at that point, you know, figuring out, I just wanted to fish and make enough money to keep the, the habit going. Fortunately, I had a, my father was a dentist and he was, he was my main sponsor at the time. So he kept the gas in the boat for us. And, um, and that's how that happened. But during, I guess it was 18, 19 years old, I was fishing. I was still in college to make owner tournaments back then. Mako Marine had had a number of these owner tournaments across the state. And I would fish at least five or six of them from South Florida up to Destin in the Panhandle. And they had one in the Bahamas and we did well with that. I had a buddy of mine and we won the angler of the year title four out of six years. Then Mako had, they would run an outdoor rider tournament where once a year Mako would pick 
eight or nine of the top fishing writers from the big magazines, Outdoor Life, Field and Stream, Saltwater Sportsman, Florida Sportsman, and they would take these riders on a one-week fishing trip, courtesy of Mako, to a resort somewhere, uh, Bahamas, you name it, and there would be Makos there where these riders would fish on Makos. And it's a perfect marketing scheme because most of those riders had an assignment, so they would write about it, and then when they needed file photos, there would be a Mako in there. Here's a guy holding a grouper. Another boat comes up, takes a picture, and they would run file photos. It just so happened as there was a Mako there. It's the greatest marketing scheme Mako ever had. My senior year of college, they invited me to fish Walker's Cave, Bahamas, help them take a number of riders fishing. They said, we cover your fuel the whole bit. I said, absolutely. So over there is when I met Barry Gibson and Rip Cunningham and Spider and Drayson from Saltwater Sportsman. And I had fished Frank Sargent who was at the time at Outdoor Life, and he knew I did a lot of sail fishing at a Palm Beach in winter. He said, George, you ever try riding? I said, no. He said, I'd like you to do a sailfish piece for us. You know a lot about sailfish. I said, Frank, I don't even know if I could write. So do it. If it's bad, no, no big deal. We'll send it back. If it's uh, salvageable, we'll polish it up and put it in there. Well, the very first piece I sold went to Outdoor Life. It was on Palm Beach sail fishing. And they were one of the higher paying magazines at the time. I got a check for $300 and I thought I was going to retire. <laughs> and uh, then Saltwater Sportsman asked me to do a story, which I did. And long story short, a year later, a position opened up in Saltwater Sportsman. They flew me to Boston and interviewed me, gave me the job. And I've been with Saltwater Sportsman since 1983. So it was the luck of being uh, my dad having Mako, owning a Mako boat. And me fishing those tournaments and meeting Bill Monroe, who was their marketing person, and him watching me fish these tournaments, invited me to fish these riders in the Bahamas, that this whole crazy thing happened. It was just, I had no intention of even doing anything like that when I graduated college. But then as life or luck would have it, boom, I ended up there. And then with Saltwater Sportsman, uh, we started the seminar series, which is still in play uh, year 36 now for that. And then the TV show, I figured, well, my next step, I want to do a television series because what I saw out there wasn't really educational. It was really, you know, boring. And we did a pilot. We got picked up by ESPN. And then, again, that was the whole history of how I ended up where I ended up. Hey, I heard Walker Ski's coming back. Is that right? It is. it is. They don't have the resorts, the big marina, the big sport boats go in, and they could base out of there and, and, and all that. So that, that has come back in that capacity. And um, my favorite good. place in the Abacos to fish is Green Turtle. Oh, yeah, Green Turtle. And that, cool actually, place next too. Sunday is, is, is the first of the two episodes we shot over Green Turtle. It, it's a magnificent place, the Green Turtle Club. It's at the, you know, you, you go there in the right months. It, it's amazing offshore fishing, and the reefs are good. It's just a real nice, quaint place that that's my favorite place in all of the bahamas would be green turtle yeah my sister got married at the green turtle club it's a cool place yeah that's it's beautiful yep the green turtle really beautiful I resort. remember that we're talking about doing a bahamas trip uh at the yeah. end of this year it's a cool place it's a good little quaint, that, quaint place yeah i guess the best place. and you have to time it if you're going here for the fishing and you're looking for the offshore you know your best months there are going to be april may and probably that very beginning of june yeah. And not that you won't catch anything mid June on, but most of those pelagics round that island, and they're gone by then. You know, uh, the dolphin strong in April. There's a good mix of them in May. The white marlin uh, really strong in May, mixed with some blues. The blue marlin really get going there towards latter May to June. But you could get all of them <coughs> as a mix. But then you go there in August, unless you're really lucky. Th th those fish have long moved, and at that point in time, it's Anchor and yellow telling, you know. Right, right. You and uh, you were. Uh, I was uh, as I was scrolling last night and going through uh, YouTube. By the way, I know your broadcast, but uh, also it's pretty easy to find any of your shows on YouTube. Yes. Um, but uh, I was. I found a show, and uh, I think you were. It was Wahoo fishing from a couple years ago. But you were talking about an episode that you had done with. Um, is it Chin Kerry Chin? Is that the artist? What? Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. Another good friend of mine, Kerry Chen. Yes, you had an artist. You would call fifty Wahoo? Is that or thirty? I or think 50? it was. I know the one you're talking about. It was. It was off the Cayman Islands. And okay, that's where that, it was. That's incredible. It was like twenty five or Wahoo. I think it was. We had twenty five Wahoo, a couple yellowfins, and we released the blue marlin. 
and we were done. I, I, I stopped the captain from fishing at 930 that morning. Cause they, they, you know, they want to just fill the boat up and sell them. I said, man, we're a spectacular show. We're going back nine o'clock. Let's, let's go. <laughs> and I thought they were going to leave me out there 90 miles offshore, but they didn't. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that, that's some catching for two hours. That was it was amazing. Every rod, nonstop. You didn't have time. If, if, if somebody didn't come out, hand you a bottle of water and take a quick sip, you didn't have time to run to the cooler and open up a bottle of water and get back out there. Those rods were singing. It was uh, this an, an insane bite. I love those days. Well, I know you. Yeah. Uh, I, I I know I know a lot of people. Um, I know you. I'm sure your dad obviously uh, was a big influence, and then of course you just mentioned Mako. But uh, if, as far as TV goes, who would you say um, was your biggest influence? Uh, maybe another television personality. Uh, oh no, or, no, no doubt, hands down, Mark Sosin. I knew it. And he, Mark Sosin was the king of saltwater television, and in his heyday, he was the king of the outdoor writing for saltwater, uh, the television deal. And, and I've always said this, um, it, it, you know, in that era, he, he, he was Richard Petty yeah. and, 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 and no doubt about it. And then he had taken a liking to me when I started fishing the Mako Owner Tournament. I met him there and then we started talking and he actually took a, a liking to me and we would chat a lot. And then he told me early on getting in the industry. Uh, gave me a lot of good tips, and he, and, he, and then once he felt comfortable that we had a good relationship, he said, "I'm going to tell you who the good guys are in this industry, and I'm going to tell you who the a." I'm not going to say it on, you can on say radio. It. Oh yeah, you can. This, We're, this is a podcast. <laughs> okay, he goes, and, and I'm going to tell you who the assholes are that you need to stay away from. And you need to watch yourself because they're all in for themselves. And and he named the names, and that was such a guiding point. And when I had questions, he would help me. He would tell me what to do and the most the best well he gave me a ton of good advice but the most successful bit of advice that he had given me he says george he said what you want to do is remain a strong independent writer don't ever ever accept the job as an editorship with a magazine where they say hey we want to move you to become the editor of say saltwater sportsman or whatever magazine he said because what happens everybody wants to be the editor uh, or publisher and they do that then the magazine gets bought then you bring a new crew in and then boom out goes those people and really other than barry gibson who was a well-known editor saltwater sportsman uh people don't under, really know a lot of the editors of these magazines they have no name recognition he said you do projects you write to keep your name out there you write to get your credibility you write to share your knowledge and then from there, you build on projects that will make the money for you. Hence the seminar series, hence the television series. He said, because the magazine ownerships could change. They could change writing staffs. They, but you've got, if you have a strong reputation, your name stands out there. You go anywhere you want. You do anything you want on your own. That was the best advice that he had given me was, uh, was that right there. And uh, it all rang true, too. And I followed a lot of what he did. And. And he was a very, very professional with the TV. I learned a lot how he did it. It was a no BS deal, you know, just 100% business. And um, he ran a good formula that had him on air forever. So, you know, you can't say enough really good things about Mark Sosin. And it was like, in racing terms, that would be like if I were to start the Indy 500, I'm a rookie. And you had Mary Andretti giving you tips on how to start and run that first Indy 500. And that's how... I think of, of Sosin. Uh, and, and, and rightly so. And I, I would put you, uh, for me, it was you, Jose, and Mark as well, um, e easily. Those, those were who I watched to try and figure out how I was going to do it and how I wanted to do it uh, when, I, when I had my show here. My local, my local show here, but uh, yep. your your show's on um, quarterly. How do you run year round? Oh, we run, now? Yeah, we run uh, uh, first quarter. Uh, and then they repeat it, repeat the show in second quarter. So we run first quarter on Discovery. We're on Sunday mornings at uh, 8 a.m. And then they repeat our uh, 13 episodes during the second quarter. And then we get cranking uh, around in April to start shooting episodes for 2024. So how it works is our filming season uh, will start this uh, April. 
and we'll normally get that last one done around November, sometimes depending on weather issues, we'll eke it into December. And then we edit the shows and then we air them, you know, first and second quarter. So the shows that we're going to start shooting in 23 will be for our 24 season. And we had our best year this past season in terms that every show we did, we had perfect weather. There was no blowouts. There's no rearranging trips that we actually wrapped up our 13th show around Halloween. We've never, ever ended that soon before and that, that was uh yeah, yeah that that was really a, a amazing thing i didn't know what to do with myself in november december well how much fun fishing do you get to do not nearly as much uh, because the television what people don't understand they say oh they see a half hour that's great you throw your boat in one day you got a show every episode we devote at least five days you have a travel day getting to a spot travel day coming home three days to film the reason we get three days is because if you have a weather issue, maybe that third day, the one will drop enough for you to get out there. And so you've got five days allotted to each episode, and that doesn't count the tackle prep in advance. You know, all sit and work on tackle based on the species you want to go for a week before and make sure we have all that ready to go. And then when you come down, it's break down and get geared up. It's, and, and it's just so much work. And then on top of that, the sponsors – have all these commitments that they ask you to do for them appearances uh fishing trips we're gonna have a contest could you take this person fishing uh they'll they'll have you do videos so so much of the when you're actually not on the water ends up for you know working with your sponsors and doing appearances and videos and all that which eats up a lot of time then i have the writing for saltwater sportsman then the seminar series so if i could get a half a dozen fun fishing days a year by fun fishing meaning no cameras just grab your your buddies used to fish with all the time and go out that would be a lot you know it, it's really all that's the, the type of commitment that this thing that i do you know requires of me and this is where you and i this is where we were all discussing before we went on air the the difference in broadcast and youtube or internet television or or entertainment whatever you want to call it yeah. Um, there, there is so much more that goes into broadcast. Um, I mean, YouTube, like you said, I got a GoPro, I got a boat or I got content. I'm going to go film it and maybe do a little tweak in editing. Of course, um, uh, uh, thanks to Adobe and other things, um, uh, anybody can be an editor now, but, and you're just going to throw it up on YouTube and it didn't cost you a dime. And in most places, or most people, they're uh, generating revenue themselves, obviously off of followers, uh, where with you, you're buying airtime. You've got to, uh, you know, pay your editors. You've got to pay your camera people. You, I mean, it's uh, so much more that goes into it. you got to go entertain those sponsors. You know, you got to do so much more. But, but I think both of them have a lot of positives. Uh, my kids uh met well russ my son met nick stanzik last weekend and now he is completely obsessed with nick's youtube channels so mm -hmm. uh you know and nick shows a lot of his life at home and and jason and i were texting last night i just don't think i would want all of that mm -hmm. on camera uh i'd like my little bit of privacy <laughs> but you know nick nick shows everything and shares a lot of stuff in his episodes but it's a big difference and i think uh, both of them again um, are po you know have have positives and have uh, bonuses, but I think broadcast is uh, just always going to be where my heart is, and and just I just know how much work goes into it. Well, the worlds apart, and, and uh, you know, and like you said, they do have their positives, and you know, uh, I know Nick very well. He does a good job there too. But for me, and again, I might be prejudiced in saying this because of how I grew up with the hardcore fishing and what I do um, is so many. Of, the, of who's out on YouTube, I, I don't want to say posers, but they're, I, I don't call, see them as legit. They go out, they'll pretend they know this, they'll go up there and they'll make these little videos and they go on and on and on. And, you know, it, it, there's just, a, in my opinion, a very few legitimate YouTubers that have a good handle on fishing that could give the good information out that could, could be entertaining. So much of it is garbage. And again, not that you don't see a lot of that show up on broadcast, but it's a little bit more of a qualification on broadcast because of the expense difference 
involved there. Uh, for you know, you got to buy airtime, like you said. I don't want to tell you what it costs to move boats around or run boats and from all different states and and production expenses a year, but you have to have sponsors that cover airtime, the expenses and, and all that. So you have to have a show that's worthy of that sponsorship. And that show has to, you know, obviously generate sales and publicity for that sponsor. And the demographics are so different between YouTubers and broadcast. Now, YouTubers, mostly a young audience, you know, a lot of young kids, teenagers and everything there who are not in position unless they have a wealthy, you know, father to buy a, a, a three hundred thousand dollar center console, a five hundred dollar pen reel, a five thousand dollar sim red unit or whatever. They they don't have that, but they'll watch. You know, if you had a tackle company that deals with lures and stuff, they work with, you know, that they fish a lot of local canals. That's one thing. Whereas you get broadcast, it's generally an older audience there, and that audience starts coming into money if you're lucky, maybe in your 40s, your 50s, or your 60s, you acquire enough of that to go ahead and do the saltwater stuff to, to, for the boat ownership and this and that. So that broadcasting market demographic is so much more aimed at the Mer you know, the Mercury's, the Mako's, the uh, Simrad's, the more expensive because it's a qualified audience of people who view it that have the income. They're an older audience versus youngsters and teenagers who don't quite have that disposable income to do those sort of things yet in their life. And that's just my take of it all. Well, it's an honest, honest take, and we and we appreciate it. Yeah, we appreciate it. And uh, you know, we've got, uh, d dear Lord, we could go on forever and ever, and uh, we're not. We're not, uh, I'm not looking at the time, I'm, I'm making aware of the time, but I do have a couple other things that I want to give Jason and um, uh, Chris and Stephen here a chance to ask some more questions, and then we have a special guest that we're going to attempt to get on, but I did want to bring up something that, uh, two different things. First and foremost, uh, when you were on the Southern English Radio Show with us here uh, several years ago, I think Kenny, my partner, brought up the banana thing, and <laughs> yes. I think the banana thing came up, and you... You don't adhere to the banana thing. It doesn't bother you. Yeah, no, not in the least. It, it's it, it's a hype, and uh, people say it brings you bad luck or whatever. And you know, I don't subscribe to any of that thing. And you know, shoot, if there's bananas in a boat, I I'd snack on them throughout the day. It doesn't make any difference. <laughs> but certain captains feel like that's a you know a no no. And 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 who really made the marketing? And I'm not sure whether he really believes it, but I think he goes with the fact. Uh, uh, to, that he believes it because it's part of his overall marketing hype is Bouncer Smith. When yep. it comes to bananas, <laughs> the person that comes to everybody's mind who hates him is Bouncer Smith. And I think that's a lot of hype to his brand. And uh, But he'll sit and if somebody comes in with a banana, he'll put the show on and yell at him and grab the <laughs> banana and throw. He goes all the way with the show with this thing, by the he way. Does. But it makes no difference. <laughs> and, and but then, I will tell you, I will tell you that, not that I'm uh, a superstitious person but when i load up my truck to go fishing i always count the number of rods that i have if there's 13 rods i either take one off or add one i won't go out with 13 rods okay so that's my theory of the banana it goes with the number 13 with rods <laughs> i used to fish with this old guy uh, my next door neighbor um he had an albemarle um 30 well he had a 32 then he had a 36 then he had the 40 41 whichever one but anyway um grew up fishing with this guy jim mcquarter and he he would always yell at people if you he had lots of weird quirks but he'd always <laughs> yell he'd always yell at people if you whistled he'd, he'd say you're, you'll whistle up a gale you'll whistle up a wind that's right i heard that <laughs> you can't whistle on a boat nope <laughs> he also he was a king mackerel fanatic now we'd we'd go troll for dolphin or wahoo or tuna or whatever when South Carolina had yellowfin, but um, but he always wanted to stop and catch king mackerel on the way home, okay? <laughs> and he would make a cold 4.30 in the morning, 3.30 in the morning on the way out. He'd make a cold king mackerel sandwich with Duke's mayonnaise, oh. Duke's mayonnaise <sighs> white bread, big bloodline running right down the middle, oh. smash it, smash it together, and he'd hand everybody on the boat one. Everybody had to eat a cold king mackerel sandwich on Wonder Bread with mayonnaise. Oh. <laughs> and you had and you had to eat it before you cleared the jetties. And I'd tell you, I tell oh. I gagged that thing down. He'd eat it three thirty in the morning with oh, a gin and tonic. That's terrible. Oh, it was just all. It was yeah. just. I, I, I don't think bouncers that bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no you had to eat this nasty king mackerel sandwich. Yeah, I think. Uh, <laughs> I, 
I think there was um, – so the incident, and, and it's been talked about before, and um, is um, – it's quite scary, and I, I, you know, when I first heard about it, obviously it was like all over uh, social media and news and everything else, kind of about what happened up here. We were, we were all like, "What? George fell off the boat?" Um, but let's talk about the incident. And uh, you, you, you said that at, the whole time you you had already had the game plan in your head, and and kind of lay it out for us and exactly what happened on that sure. day. You were with Nick Stanzik. Yeah, and we were shooting an episode, and, and for those who, who just tuned in and wonder what we're talking about is is when I ended up going overboard, hooked up to a, a broadbill swordfish, uh, strapped in the harness and, and all that, and, um, and this was, I even forgot what year, 2008 maybe, uh, somewhere around there, um, maybe later, Nick and I had got together to do a swordfish show at Isla Mirada, and we had gone out and dropped down immediately and hooked a fish I, I fought a fish for about almost an hour and 40 minutes had to get close to the boat we saw it a beautiful fish two 300 pounder and a hook pulled i think of what terrible luck first drop what a beautiful fish camera boat was in position we go right back on the numbers again bait hits the bottom bam instantly we're on another swordfish i fight this one for about the same period of time maybe a little longer start coming in view another two 300 pound fish and what you know it, the hook pulled so now I'm I'm just dejected. How many shots are you going to get at this? We go right on the number again and instantly hook up a third time. Wow. So I get back in the harness and I'm fighting this fish. And during the fight, um, maybe before we even started, I have the restraints that clip on to the rod that clips back to the boat. And so you don't lose a rod or if you go overboard, attached to it you've got these restraints or you can attach it to your uh, harness like a leash. and i have them and yeah you know, leash exactly and nick said you want to hook the leashes up I said nah I'll leave them in there i'm not going to take them out and because i figured it was going to look goofy and uh <laughs> so we're fighting this fish for god uh, uh, this was a, 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 a tough fish the third one it, it was i don't know hour and 45 minutes maybe closer to, to two and we're finally getting it somewhat close. And, and now, mind you, I'm in a 50 um, or an 80 international maybe, and I'm strapped into shoulder harnesses and a waist harness, so it's clipped to the reel. And I'm just working the fish, and we're getting it maybe 100 yards, and, and I'm standing by my outboards. And then the camera boat starts coming around my outboards to come video me, and the, and the line is still deep, but it's out in that angle. So I start yelling at the camera, but my buddy was around. I said, Carl, what are you doing? What are you doing? He said, the camera guys want me to, to move in there. And the camera guy's saying, George, we want to need to see your face. We want to see your, your ass while well, we're seeing it from the backside. And I said, don't do it here. I said, we already had bad luck and lost two. The line's out there. Go back around the boat, come in through the bow. And then come in that angle, the sun will be at your back. You get a good view of us, and you won't interfere with the fish, which is running out. Right. So he starts moving out, and I'm fighting this fish. And in the corner of my eye, I see the camera boat coming around the bow. And I go to bend down to take a crank on the fish. At the same time I had done that, the boat wake from him coming around laps the side of my boat boom just enough that that it threw me off balance where my feet went out from under me the weight of the swordfish uh, tumbles me into the water and the first is it's the freakiest feeling you could imagine i don't care how many times you go offshore fishing i'm in the water going down and it's just all blue and blue you hear all the bubbles and everything and the first thing that came to my mind was, so this is how I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. And I, and then my mind shifted gears. No, this is not how you're going to die. Go, you're going to die. Go back to your, your, your release uh, plans. And the first one, I had three of them. First one was to slowly back the drag off the reel. Okay. Had I not backed the drag off, the weight of the fish would continue to pull you down and you're going to drown. If you freaked and went completely free spool, the braid would backlash and lock up and be just like having a heavy drag. The fish would put, pull you down. So I backed off the drag very slowly till the pressure alleviated and I was able to start coming back up. 
and I came back up and I grabbed, you know, the, the side of the boat, took a breath, and I said, okay, the next step of my plan was to grab the rod, pull it to your chest, reach in, unclip yourself from the harness, and swim out of it. So I go to do step two, but but the problem, I can't find the rod. And I'm reaching out, where the freak is this rod? <laughs> so I grab back up on the side of the boat, my left hand, and I'm holding and thinking, okay, I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to have one shot to try to figure out where this rod is. And Nick Stanzik is grabbing me and trying to hold me. And I slapped his hand off. <laughs> I, I, and, and I said, if I'm Nick Stanzik is 88 pounds soaking wet. <laughs> yeah. And if I'm going to drown, I'm not going to take him with me. So I slapped his hand off me. And so fortunately, I did not have to to try step two because at that point one of the camera producers had jumped in the water saw the trouble came swimming over and he saw what had happened when i took the tumble the rod went down and twisted around my 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 stomach lower stomach the rod was between my legs so when i was in the water trying to reach for it there was no rod there he came in got his hand underneath the reel which was almost turned completely around on my stomach unclipped one side and i was able to swim out of that the drag was still you know backed off enough to where uh the fish was was, was taking line but not rapidly i passed the rod to nick he puts it in the holder and said nick advance the drag is that fish still there and he did yep still here so i go swimming around the transom <laughs> of my boat to get in there and i pull myself up and my belt wedges in my transom and I can't get in there. And I'm thinking, what the hell else is gonna go wrong here today? Yeah. So I finally got into the transom. It wasn't pretty. I looked like a big old seal trying to get in there in a, in a harbor, got on the boat, got back on the rod, camera guys got back in their boat and fought the fish for another half hour. And I was like jello at that point. I fought him, I saw him coming up and Nick says, now, how do you want us to do this for the camera? Do you want me to uh, dart the fish with a dart, or do you want me to stick a gaff in them? And I said, you hit, you kill that fish the fastest way you know how. <laughs> yeah. And he hit it with a dart, and he said, we got him. I said, did you get him? Yeah. And then once he brought that up and then stuck a gaff in him, I got out of that harness. I was exhausted. I couldn't, I was so like Gumby, that little rubber doll thing. I, I couldn't even have the strength to help Nick get that swordfish over the transom. Somehow we had to get it through the little transom door in the Mako and we got it in there. And um, it was a eye-opening experience. And the third part of my plan, by the way, which would not have worked, was if all else fails, I can't clip out, you grab your pliers and cut the line. But the problem, the pliers were on my belt and I had all the heavy harnesses around so I could not get to them. So the, yep. the, 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 the moral here, is I didn't want to look goofy and put those uh, leashes on. And because I said in the show, it's not gonna happen to us, we're too seasoned out here. Accidents always happen to the other guy. And that day I was the other guy. And and um, and number two is you don't have your pliers on the inside for a game like that. You have those cutoffs strapped in a couple of positions that you get too fast if need be. And, and I was mad for a number of months I was upset. They're all saying, man, you almost died. I said, I didn't die. I was just mad that that had happened. And I was angry. And it, about a year later, it settled in that how lucky I got because Kevin, who jumped in to get me and save me, he said, you realize how lucky you are that that rod, when it tumbled between your legs, the braid could have wrapped around the tip of that rod or wrapped around your foot and you would have gone down and drowned. And I didn't realize that at the point that that could have happened. Then I realized maybe I was a little bit closer to the... Uh, you know, leaving the building than I thought. Yeah. Wow. I, um, well, first of all, I'm glad you survived, but I, I fish, I was fishing Big Rock when the guy died. Chris Bowie was. His oh, name. I remember that. I, I remember, I still remember his name because it was so shocking when, when they came over the radio and t talked to everybody about it. But so it, since, since then, that guy, I don't know if y'all remember that or not. No, I don't. That's why, I, so he was hooked up, stand up. He, no, he wasn't hooked. He, he was actually hand lining the fish to the back of the boat. And, um, if I remember correctly, you know, he, it slipped over his thumb or he didn't have his thumb, you know, how you're supposed to wrap over your thumb that way you can, and, uh, it cinched down on his hand and drug him to the bottom and killed him. They never found him. Wow. Um, but since that day, it, it's, 
it was like branded in my brain since that day. I'm I'm like you. I think about it when that happens, I, and I tell other people too. But I think about it, and I have a game plan. My game plan's always been: I grab my knife, which is always hooked on my pocket. I always have it. You know, if it, if I'm wearing slickers, I put it on the outside of my slickers. It's clipped. I grab it. I cut the line. Swim to the top. Whatever. But I think you got to think about it. You got to have a plan because weird things do happen, and you're you're proof of that. A hundred percent. And I've always fished center consoles. I always fished for big game, and you knew sooner or later it was going to happen. And yeah. on a trip to Venice, Louisiana, years ago, years before that experience, I was on this big boat and was fighting a marlin, and I was in the fighting chair, and the fighting chair actually collapsed and ended up in the corner of the cockpit. And, you know, fortunately, I was able to get out of that. People grabbed it. But that stuck in my mind at that, you know, fighting chair collapsed. And, yeah. you know, you could easily get take a tumble over. So it's always make sure that you're always prepared for something like that. And it's and, and the thing about it all is you have to have a clear head to go through that because it's so frequent at the water. Most people just freak and panic and, and you're gone. I don't know. How, you just got to overcome the panic and just think, all right, here's a step. Try it. One, two. It's a weird thing. And um, fortunately, I was dialed into that. And, you know, it was it was something else that that was for sure. That was my uh, I like to say going over the wall at Daytona experience. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. Well, I'll tell you, the uh, uh, the the video is on YouTube. You can find it. No problem. Just go. Um, Google George Poveromo, and you can find it on there. It's uh, the incident, I think, is the name of it. I sent it to Jason last night. But um, real quick, we'll go around the room and uh, any other uh, get some questions here. And uh, George, we we definitely probably going to need to have you on again in the next year. Or so uh, uh, this is we could continue to go on and on and on because I wanted to talk to you really about how the fishing industry has changed over the last couple of years, and uh, your job has changed a little bit, and. Uh, you, you mentioned Simrad Electronics and just how that game has changed uh, for the most part. But, Jason, uh, you got some questions or any question in particular you want to ask George? Sure. Um, I, I would say what is your favorite episode that you ever filmed in your 23 seasons? Uh, that's always a tough one. There have been some spectacular ones. But I'd have to say it was my first year when I took my young daughter, Megan, and uh, God, I won't even say she was about uh, five years old, catching trout in Biscayne Bay in a, in a, in a little 17 foot Mako, going in the bait and tackle shop, you know, having her pick out the live shrimp and going out and catching sea trout where I grew up catching sea trout. That, that you know, from the sentimental value, you know, you can't top that. But as far as, say, um, non-family oriented shows, um, I would shoot. That's a tough one. There's been so many good ones. Uh, the 143 pound Wahoo, I caught in San Salvador was definitely a good one there. Uh, uh, when I, you know, the swordfish deal with Nick was a, uh, that, that was, that was a barn burner there. It kept people on the edge of the seats, I think for that one. Um, there's been just so many good ones. It, it, it's, you know, shoot. And I, I enjoy when I go up the Northeast, uh, like Jersey. I can New tell. England. <laughs> yes, it, it, it's so different from what we do here. It's like another world, and when you, especially when you have your boat, it, it, it it's just it's different, and it's like whoa, they have some really crazy good fisheries up there. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Well, Stephen's got a question, and then he's he's got to go get dressed, but we're gonna we're gonna get him in, let him ask his questions. And uh, I'm sure he's got a good one, so be prepared. Yeah, I gotta go. I'm ready. I gotta go put on a suit and tie. For he's got to go put on a suit and tie. Yeah. No, I, I I always ask celebrity guests this, and I'm gonna call you a celebrity if that doesn't offend Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Um, but uh, I want to know something that the public doesn't know about you. Tell us something that that only George Pavaromo or his closest friends and family knows about George Pavaromo. That um. <clears throat> It's sort of hard because the way I'm on TV is sort of the way I am here. And, and, and what's sort of funny is this. Okay, I'll give you one. Okay. Is, um, I'm, you know, very family-oriented, uh, you know, daughters, your grandkids, the whole bit. And what's funny about it is that, you know, when you step out your door and you put that little white Columbia visor on, you, you take on this different persona. And you're the TV guy, your seminar guy, the whole bit. And, you know, you get a lot of accolades for that. 
And then when you come in your house, sometimes you, you, your head gets a little big and I'll be honest there too. And you'll come in and you'll start, Hey, I got brag about this. We got this, 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 and, and you'll start to maybe, hey, okay, I'll just say bragging about it to family, you know, you know, your family yep. and it automatically they'll deflate your head so fast. It's not even funny. And um, <laughs> they shut you right down. I know all about that. Right <laughs> even and, and I both and, know and, about that. And, yeah. and my wife says, you know, you got all those followers on, on your friends and, on your social media, they're not really your friends. Oh, he yeah. said, if, if you were ever in trouble, they're not your friends. And, and so all of a sudden, not only did they let the air out of your head, but they let out so much. You ever see a bicycle tube that you buy and it's all folded up in this little box. That's how much air is out of my head when I come in this house. <laughs> when I, when I, when I'm in here, I'm completely deflated. And somebody asked Megan, my youngest daughter once, say, hey, how's it feel to have a dad that's a big fishing celebrity? No, to me, he's just my dad. And so, which is good. So yeah. any, anytime you start getting a little, you know, big headed out there, you come back home and they deflate it. So well, that's good for I you. Though. That. You know, you, you need, yeah, it think, is good. I think you need that kind of thing. You need to be, um, you need to be set straight. Cause and I'll, give, I'll give you another thing yeah. is, uh, you know, growing up, uh, another passion of mine was stock cars. I used to go every Saturday night, my grandfather at Hialeah Speedway for 10 years and in between the fish and i used to race go-karts too and when i was 16 i wanted to start going into stock cars with like a starter class my grandfather was going to help me get going he was a foreman for a road construction company and that was a cardinal rule with my, with my mom and dad that that would never happen they were so anti-racing and it, it actually created a rift between my grandfather and them and they, they my dad flat out told me he said if i ever catch you in a race car he said i will personally break your legs than for us to sit and watch you break your legs in a crash mm -hmm. and so there was no so basically because of that i went full tilt boogie into fishing but had they allowed me to do that back then we might not have been talking from the fishing perspective today right. so there was another little crossroads that most people didn't know that i was Big stock car fan. Very, very wow, cool. that's awesome. I, I, that is pretty cool. I, we got a good friend of ours who probably will appreciate that when I tell him. He's uh, 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 one of he'll, he'll be co-hosting with me for a little while when Stephen's gone overseas uh, defending our freedom and rights here. Uh, and he's a big NASCAR racer or, or driver, I guess you would call it. But um, at any rate, well, I'll tell you what, uh, Senator, thank you so much. And uh, he's got to go. He's, he's got to go to work. So. And I want to thank you, Senator, too, for, you know, obviously your contributions to the country and what you do. It's uh, wholeheartedly appreciated. And uh, I was only just in here with the spearfish. And I don't want to get a speeding ticket when I come through South Carolina. No, you're, you're hey, you, you, you'll be in good shape. Yeah, you'll be in good shape with that. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> I promise you. All right, Chris, come on. You got a question? Man, that's hard to follow up there. Um, really, I mean, I'm not per se a question, but I'm. Kind of excited for him to come up our way and fish our waters there. And I'm kind of hoping that maybe, I know you said we got three days of filming, but hopefully we bang it out one day and maybe you get to add an extra fun day of fishing in there with these boys. That's what that would uh, what we'd hope to do. That's the best thing. And and then we're and you and I need to pick some dates. Uh, they're putting a, a 21 Mako. It's a deep V, as I mentioned, yep. for this shoot. And, you know, with delays and parts and all that, we should have the boat. I'm ex hoping to have it by March, and that's the one I want to take up there because rather than the 33 footer, I think that's probably more suited yeah. for what we're gonna do. Unless you think the 33 is better, what's your take? Um, I mean, a 21 would do just fine. I mean, I used to do it in a 19 foot Maycraft, honestly, before I got my bay boat. But um, yeah, no, it should be totally fine. And with the Bass Pro Shop being there, they might even lend you a boat if you don't have it in time. <laughs> I know they've, all, they've <laughs> yeah. done that prior before, but uh, a lot of the areas we're going to be fishing is probably going to be some of those artificial reefs or nice. wrecks nice. and stuff like that, like we talked about earlier. And you'll be amazed on the amount of fish that surround these areas. And I know you say you don't throw a cast net, but um, during that time of the year, we, we have a, you know the spade fisher around. So as long as you know how to work a dip net... You'll, oh, you're going to be the dip net man. You'll be able to help for, me pick up those jelly, jelly balls, balls up, yep. going up and oh, down the beach yeah. there. I had done that once before uh, at, a South, at Edisto with Humpy Wheeler from Charlotte Motor Speedway. He, mm -hmm. he had a 23 Mako. He took me out well before the TV, and we were netting these big jelly balls, and we were putting them out on a rope for chum, and they yep. come up there, and it was, it was amazing fish 
for, from a fighting standpoint, and he kept a few and cooked them, and they were delicious. They're oh, good. Yeah. They're, it's an amazing sight, fight, everything. They are. They are good. And I've also heard uh, that the crabs that are in their shells do not let them go. Keep those crabs, freeze them. They are incredible for sheep's head. Oh, I bet. Oh, good. Sheep's head, love them. So, those big cobia like them, too. I know. The bigger ones? Yeah. yeah. You cut a cobia open, and he's got like 20 of them in his stomach. And I think I got the bridge between your spear fishing and the avid angler there. Uh, I got so frustrated. <laughs> I haven't gotten certified. I, I want to start diving more. But uh, instead of getting in the water, I bought a camera to drop in the water so I can see him live down there before. Oh, I'm that's there. cool. So we can see all that and kind of justify whether it's a good spot or not before we – you know, waste a little time fishing there. That's great. Uh, that, that is awesome. Now I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So we, we'll pick, let's pick a uh, three days and then I'll get it there on the calendar and, and uh, make that one happen. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, i tell you what I got. Uh, I, I want, I want to try something. I want to try and get this person on. We'll end the show with this person and uh, uh, have them on. If I can get them on here. And I, I want to make sure first and foremost that if, I happen to cut you off, George, which I don't think is going to happen. I I can do a three way call. I'm pretty okay. Uh, I'm I'm a redneck from South Carolina, but I can <laughs> I can work this iPhone. But I do want to go ahead and tell you right now, thank you so much, and I appreciate you taking the time and 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 going back five years ago before we even knew each other, and you jumped right in with the radio show, and we came down, did the show there at the theater before your seminar. Uh, but you have been a uh, uh, wonderful person, and, and you know, like a couple weeks ago, Jason and I um, somewhat sponsored that King Mackerel team that came down, and you were very kind to give some great tips, and uh, they ended up finishing 14th, I think. Yeah, 14th overall. They couldn't make it to where they needed to be. All the winning fish came from exactly where we talked about, the other side of the Tortugas. Yeah. Um, they did. They all came from there. Uh, we had another good friend who finished second, I think, mm -hmm. and he he – in a 10-hour fishing day, he got one hour and 20 minutes of fishing time because he took the beating and took made the trip in his 27-foot boat to get out there and fish for an hour and five minutes, yeah, crazy. called a 50 and a 40, and then turned around and came back. So I know. It was, br it was brutal wind when that was going on. It was it was brutal. <laughs> but you are incredible. You've been, you've, you've, you've been wonderful on the television, and uh, I'm so glad that I got to go to your seminar series. I went to one in 2000, uh, I want to say eight or even before that, is where I really kind of fell in love with saltwater fishing. You had had Brent McMullen there. You had that Larry Horowitz. You had um, uh, Mike Mc – no, not Mike McDonald. You had – the old guy from North Carolina, the flounder guy. Jimmy Price. Jimmy. Jimmy. Was it Jimmy Price? He yeah. passed away, correct? He did. I yeah, know, that's did. terrible. Yeah, Jimmy there, and it was it was just great to hear all those guys. But I keep up the great work with the seminar series, and I know real quick if somebody wants information on it, they can go to your website, right? Uh, they could. They could go to georgepoveromo.com, which will tell them all about our episodes coming up on television. And, uh, yeah, they could segue to the uh, seminar series uh, TV, which will be airing in second quarter this year. And then starting in 24, the eight-stop uh, ground tour resumes. So we'll be back on the road. Okay, perfect. Yeah, a lot of people are asking. Good. So it, it, there are plans to go back to doing it in person. That is correct, yes. Well, that's great. Well, I'll tell you what. Don't go anywhere. Hang on one second. Nope, I'm, I'm hanging I'm gonna on. I'm going to pull this number up real quick. Okay. Let's see if I can get this in here. Oh, it doesn't my. My phone doesn't recognize my – oh, there it goes. I was like, my phone doesn't recognize my face with this system on top of my head. This is kind of rookie right here. Let's see. It's going to put him on mute for a minute. Now, the fun thing is it... – hey, that's you, starters. Hey, 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 hang on one second. Let's merge this call here. All right, we're merging. All right, we're merged. Can you all hear? I can that's hear. You. Dead Sea Charters. <laughs> oh, my we'll goodness. We won't gaff them or net them. <laughs> oh, my. Boy. You know, when I hear that guy's voice, I, I just hear Christmas carols. Silent <laughs> Night. That, the one, the only, Bouncer Smith. Uh, wow. Now, how the heck did you get on there, Bouncer? These are two of two. Captain English, when I hear his voice, all I think of missed gaff shots. And now I saw... Mike Brandywine couldn't net his triple tail, and and the the uh, podcast guy couldn't net the tuna. 
I think George is the problem with the gap in his neck. <laughs> I could very well be. You never know. <laughs> oh, man. Another... How are you doing, George? I, I'm doing fine. Uh, 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 you want you want to laugh at something? We're good for, well, Bouncer uh, will set a, he did our televised seminar series about a week, a little over a week ago. To yeah, yeah. That's right. And that morning when I left the hotel, somebody stole my truck. And we still had to do the seminars, but a long story short, I got my truck back in 100% perfect condition. They found it. Really? That's great, George. Who Where stole they it? it? They found it in Miami. As it turned out, when the detective called me when it was over, uh, I did the report that morning before the seminar, and then a detective called me. And I started, you know, talking to detectives. You know, I do this report. He was asking me all the questions. And he goes, I just want you to know your voice sounds a little bit different on the phone that it does on TV. And he goes, I'm a big fan. I watch your show all the time. I fish. And from that point on, he was all over the case. Um, it, it, to make a long story short, um, they traced it. Since they disabled GPS, they traced it through the Wi-Fi. I had to go to AT&T to give the detective and the police force permission to get to my account to get whatever signal. And they sent it to one of his co-parts in Miami who found it parked near a school. And they figured they maybe whoever stole it thought it was hot. They're going to give it a day or two to make sure, you know, it was still there. And then they would go ahead and move it out on a freighter or whatever. But they found it before that even happened. They got right on the thing. So that was just one lucky wow. thing. Wow. That's great. And, and I know really why they rejected your truck, George. In the bed of your truck were all those nets with no netting left in them and all those straightened out gab books. And they figured anybody that had that much trouble boating a fish didn't deserve to lose their truck. I think that's the case. Well, well, in reality, what was in the back of the cab locked up, which they did take, is we had the extra Columbia shoes in case some faculty members that they they didn't fit right. There was about a dozen pairs of Columbia shoes in their boxes in the back. They got that. Then also in the console of my truck, which was going to be for a little celebrate after the seminar, I had a bottle of Papa's Pilar, and then Son of a Guns took that too. Oh, oh. That's well, worst. I'll tell you this. It had good taste. Yeah, they had well, good taste. I sent you a note. Now, I've had trouble with one of my toes for oh, two yeah. years. And since I started wearing these Columbia shoes that you had us all wear for the show, my toe hasn't hurt one bit. These are the best shoes. I don't know what they call them, but they're made by Columbia. And they got like an elastic shoelace on them. And they are fantabulous. Of course, it could be that with all the cold weather and rain up here in Marietta, Georgia, it could be that. I've been drinking so much Papa's Pilar that I haven't <laughs> rained. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, you probably don't even know you don't have shoes on. I don't even have feet. No, I had to put them on because my feet were too cold this morning. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. That is that great. Is. Hey, that so is funny. I, I, now that we got both of y'all on the phone, I, I, I got to hear this story. Before we get off of here, and, and, and so we let everybody ask a question, and the senator asked a question. He wanted to hear from George something that nobody knows and, uh, so, you know, with George, obviously, in television, everybody knows pretty much what's going on with him. But, Bouncer, what, what can you share? You have something to share, a great story of, or something about George that most people might not know? Well, it's kind of a sad story. But for years, George and I have been buddies. I mean, we shot the cover of Saltwater Sportsman magazine about 1983 or 1984. And we go back even before that because... George hooked me up with Evan Root even before that uh, through our good friend Billy Carson. But but anyway, we go back a long, long ways. And George would never have me on his show when he was doing a fishing show. He had me on the stage, and we've been doing these uh, recorded seminars, but never on a live fishing show. And he finally took me out. And I kept telling him every time I hooked a fish on the bottom to whine faster because the sharks were going to get his fish. <laughs> And, and we caught African Pompano and Amber Jacks and stuff. But we finally caught a mutton snapper. I kept going, George, faster, faster. Well, he got the lips of the mutton snapper. The shark got the rest. And on top of that, 
another reason he didn't want me back again was because I made him catch a sailfish hooked in the tail. And they fight very, very hard. <laughs> and I made him catch a 42-pound black fin tuna. And I filleted it for him. And then we found out that we filleted what would have tied the world record for the biggest black fin tuna ever caught on 20-pound test. Oh, wow. He's been so mad at me ever since <laughs> about filleting his tuna and reprimanding him for whining too slow. He didn't want me back because none of his guests ever embarrass him. And I just was relentless for the whole TV show. I couldn't imagine that out of you, Bouncer. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, oh, that natural bouncer puts a little bit of a spin on there too. But uh, you know, it, uh, we're fishing and we're doing these shows, and it dawned on me, what the heck, bouncer and I had never done a show together. So I said, let's go out there and do that. And um, and we had one heck of a a, a a day. It was really incredible. That blackfin tuna was amazing. But I but I got a bouncer story where I don't know if you a lot of people don't know, but. Bouncer almost had me crash in the mangroves in Key Largo once. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, but that you know, was in your truck, not in your boat. <laughs> that's right. We we were in my truck, and we were we were doing a story for Saltwater Sportsman, a nighttime Kubera snapper. Okay, this was way before the TV shows, and we're doing a feature. So Bouncer and I had got the lobsters in the truck, and we're driving to Ocean Reef, and we're going down this uh, mangrove line piece of road. And bouncers explaining now when you feel the hit, you know, you're going to feel maybe, you know, a, a tap and a hard jerk goes like this. So he grabs my, my, my arm and he'll go just like this. It gives you a hard tug to the right. And here goes the truck aiming right towards the mangroves there. We gotta, <laughs> I got to straighten that one up there. But that Kubera snapper uh, bite example almost ended up going deep in, in the mangroves. Yeah, but giving wow. credit where credit's due, George, you responded so good on the strike. That you never even crossed the white line. <laughs> no, that, that's my go kart racing experience coming through. <laughs> oh man, you you guys are but awesome. What a time George and I have spent together. I mean, we've been we did the, some of the best seminars in the history of the saltwater seminar series. Uh, we were in Atlanta when it snowed, and I got in trouble with my son. I've been up in Atlantic City when the snow was so thick that the cab couldn't get me back to the airport and the whole harbor was covered with snow. And we went to Chicago <laughs> in December and we had more people on the stage than we had in the audience. But just so that George would never remember what a failure the show was, I gave him a private serenade of christmas carols in the evening i did my specialty which is silent night and george had had this beautiful bone-in axe handle ribeye and when i got done singing all this ground up ribeye was on the floor of the restaurant <laughs> that was a, i gotta elaborate on that of all the seminars <laughs> they're always a hit we got cocky one year and decided whatever i'll say the the long-winded reason behind it to do one in chicago so we go to chicago in december bring up all the faculty because there's no local saltwater guys bring up production teams we've got a fancy theater drury lane theater and all of a sudden, pre-registration is 42 people. I said, what the heck are we going to do? And Sosan was still with us. He said, George, you got to go on with the show. And we had 42 more show up at the door. We had 84 people in total in there and in a 3,000-seat auditorium. So Bob McNally asked one of our faculty, what are we going to talk about? And I said, we can talk about whatever we want. We outnumber them. So we do this. <laughs> We couldn't get out that night. We're stuck in a real fancy Marriott and it's snowing. So we go upstairs to their restaurant and they have a violin uh, person serenading the tables with a violin and they come to our table and they ask, would you like to hear anything? So Bouncer goes silent night and <laughs> Bouncer starts singing silent night. Holy. And it was it was such a bad experience I, I was pinching my leg i think i'm gonna wake up from this nightmare i'm gonna tell people you're not gonna believe what we just did in chicago how bad it was and bouncer was singing but it was a reality and uh 
So the one, <laughs> the one bomb seminar we did lives on in infamy because uh, bouncers Christmas carols. Wow. Yeah, but you know, George, in reality, if the outdoor writer for Chicago hadn't had a heart attack, he may have sold us a whole full audience. But I don't know about recall, that. For six weeks, he was out sick. Uh, I went to Chicago another time to a fishing show, and they had a great turnout. And uh, I believe that there's an audience there. Just we had bad timing and everything else. Plus, well, if you, if you go back up there, let me know how it turns out, bouncer. Oh, <laughs> that, I know what that means. Well, I tell you well, what. Hey, both of y'all, both of y'all. I, I just want to say this. Thank you so much for joining us. We we're at uh, almost two hours. That's awesome. I knew it would be that way with these two. That's awesome, man. Well, with George, but uh, I I I, I want to say that the sport of fishing, and I'm sure these two across from me, the sport of fishing is better because of both of y'all. Absolutely. Uh, in yeah. so many different regards, Bouncer, I, I can't tell you how much uh, we have enjoyed having you in the inlet from time to time. Uh, but both of y'all make this sport so much better, and you mean so much to it. And I want to thank y'all both for taking the time to talk with us. And Bouncer's been on before and had his – he's had his whole episode, George, so don't feel bad if I cut him off. But um, <laughs> uh, but but y'all do. Y'all mean so much to the sport. Um, and I can't wait to see you again soon, Bouncer. And, uh, George, you've always got an invitation to come up here and hang out with us in the inlet and hope when you come with Chris you'll uh, – Come down south and come visit us here in the inlet. We'll go to dinner and uh, drink some of that uh, rum, that fine rum you well, got. Well, it, it all depends on how good uh, Chris is putting us on fish. You uh, up that early, we'll do that. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> Listen, don't put any more nerve. Don't put any more nerves on him than he's already going to have because I, I, <laughs> he is going to be so pumped up. Trust me. And and by the way, huh? it, it, oh, he's going to be pumped up. But he is a great cameraman as well. So. If you need to flip flop him with the cameraman for some reason, he's really good at camera. I, I had him spend uh, a day of catching mahi offshore as a cameraman, and then most of the time he sat on the cowlings of the motors. Yeah, he said, "Don't drop that camera." Said, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> he did a great job from behind. But I want to thank both y'all for uh, joining us here. And uh, man, anytime y'all are in town or anytime you got uh, anything you want to share, give us a shout, and we love having y'all on. Jason, any last words you want to? Nah, man, it's, it, like you said, it's just two two of the best fishermen out there to influence people on TV, social media, and all that. And I, personally, I want to thank y'all for everything that you do for the sport. Yep. Chris, you well, good? appreciate you having us on. It, it, was a, it was a fun two hours. It seemed like five minutes, but uh, that's how you know it went well. That's exactly how it goes. All right, Bouncer, thanks for taking the time, buddy. I'm sorry to pull you away from that beautiful weather you're having there in Marietta. <laughs> no problem. As soon as, as soon as the ice is out, in Merle's Inlet, I'll be over there ready to fish again because that's some of the best fishing I have in the course of the year. The flounder, the redfish, the groupers, the wahoo. You guys have got it all, plus the great food and the great hospitality. Well, Merle's Inlet is one beautiful place I, to spend time. I just love when Bouncer goes and gives Buddy crap up there about his cleaning job when he's cleaning fish at the flay table. <laughs> that always cracks me up. I love that. That's entertainment right there. <laughs> well, we what we'll do next time when Bouncer's having court there at the Merle's Inlet Fishing Charter Station, yes. we need to video Bouncer as he's having court over there and uh, talking to all of, of us young bucks, or y'all young bucks. I, I don't want to throw myself in there. But uh, at any rate, y'all, thanks so much for joining us, and uh, have a great day, and uh, we'll we'll talk to y'all soon. I'll get this it thing up good. today. Take, all right, take, thank you. Take care. All right, what awesome. We're not We're not done, by the way. Yeah, we are. We're getting ready to be done. But anyway, that was great. That is awesome. Oh, yeah, that was awesome. That was great. And and uh, that worked out perfect, having Bouncer join in for the last little bit. <laughs> He's a trip. He's so full of energy. I mean, you, you got to love a guy like that. There's never I mean, a dull moment. Nah. Never. never a dull moment. And and I think the man loves fishing more now than he did when he was running charters. I told him that on the phone when I talked to him earlier. I was like, I think you actually get to enjoy fishing now. Well, you know, as a fishing guy, you, you're not always fishing. A lot of times you're uh, – Taking guiding. people to the fish. You're guiding. Well, we have now set the record. That's one hour and 51 minutes of lot. Trilogy yeah. Outdoors podcast. But don't forget, you can always stop by any of our wonderful distributorships here along the Grand Strand or go to www.trilogyoutdoorsmedia.com. Download Trilogy Outdoors magazine. Check it out. And let me announce now that Bouncer Smith, you, you, you've heard him. You've heard him several times. You know his books, Bouncer's Chronicles. You can find them. Well, now... 
he is going to be joining the Trilogy Outdoors magazine writers, and uh, we'll have him to share every month, along with Captain Cephas McRae of Nuts and Bolts of Fishing, and we're super excited about that. Uh, but we will get this thing up today, and uh, the senator had to go do his duties and uh, slide out, but uh, it was great. Thank you guys both for joining us. Uh, everybody, how can they get in touch with y'all? Merle's in the Fishing Charters? Easiest way with us, um, it's probably our website. It's MIFCFishingCharters.com, or you can give us a call the old-fashioned way at 843-798-9100. Get your trips booked now, yeah, Fine same. Catch. How to yeah, same thing, uh, FindCatchFishingCharters.com. You can book online there, online calendar, see everything, all social medias. You know, just search Fine Catch Fishing Charters, and you can find me. And the phone number is 843-655-6440. Make sure you get it right. I saw you think have to stop and think. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, anyway. Well, I'll tell you what, folks. We're going to um, – let's see what we got planned for next week. I'm trying to think. Uh, next week, we do not have a guest lined up just yet, so who knows what we'll be talking about next week. But duck season is over tomorrow, and uh, we can all, all – all you can go back to life as normal. All you crazy watermen, um, but I don't think I'll get the opportunity. Today would be a good day to go uh, do the afternoon hunt if you think you could pull it off. Uh, they fly in early in the rain. I wish. They fly in early in the rain. Well, listen, get signed up for the Grand Strand Fishing Rodeo. By the way, Jason Burton, there's your prizes for winning the trout division yes. in December. And uh, make sure you get signed up. Also, that is right on the website. Click on the rodeo logo, and you can find all the information right there. But, hey, we're going to get out of here. We've got, got to get out the Trilogy podcast studio since um, the senator's already gone. So we're going to lock up and get on out of here. But don't you get out of here. Make sure you click like, subscribe, and share with all your friends. And join us next week. We're going to talk more fins, fur, and feathers right here on Trilogy Outdoors. Trilogy Outdoors podcast is a product of Trilogy Outdoors Media. All views and opinions of our hosts and guests are not necessarily those of our sponsors. Trilogy Outdoors is produced and edited by Trilogy Outdoors Media. Be sure to follow us on all the podcast platforms as well as our social media pages on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And also, don't forget our other brands, Southern English Radio Show and Walk em All Outdoor Magazine. To find more information, visit TrilogyOutdoorsMedia.com. And remember, if it's anything dealing with fins, fur, and feathers, you're going to find it right here on Trilogy Outdoors.